Before I get started, I want to introduce my traveling buddies today, Andrew Labai and Adam Elrod. They work with me at, in, in our program in Fredericksburg. These are the guys that make me look good. And uh, Rick Dunst, my, my dear friend, who, Rick was my research counterpart at Cornell. He ran the Fredoni Experiment Station for 30 years. He can vouch that, that I was there 88 to 96. Um, so now Rick and his wife are here on vacation. It's snowing, it's 30 degrees in New York, and so they're glad to be here for a while. Um, basically, I guess I felt I had carte blanche to talk about what I wanted to during this seminar. So I wanted to be reflective over the last 17 years of, of the main problem that I, ran, I stumbled into when I came here, what we've done to address it, and, and some of the side shoots from, from that opportunity. Jim, turn off the front set of lines. Perfect. So our Troy probably remembers this site. This was Ned Sims Vineyard, uh, uh, 1996. It was a uh, first one was a Chardonnay block that was uh, became 100 percent infected uh, and died. Uh, there's a number of speculations, speculative reasons why, but uh, basically Pierce's disease up until about 1996. We didn't think it was a problem in the hill country. It was more of a, a transition zone. Uh, Bob Overhelman had been there for many years, and we hadn't really seen any PD. No other people were planting vinifera and didn't have a problem. And all of a sudden, we believe in response to a number of mild winters that allowed insect populations to rise and a lack of cold therapy on grapevines, we started to see PD pop up in the hill country. It became quite an epidemic. Uh, Pierce disease is not new in Texas, nor was I new to PD. Uh, this was, uh, oops, excuse me, Ron Perry's feasibility study published in 1974, a feasibility study for the grape production in Texas. And in that study, Ron published this map that I've colorized, but basically it talked about the probability of Pierce's disease increasing the further away from the coast you got. We didn't really know if it was the, uh, the range of the insect vectors or cold temperatures. We really didn't know at that time what limited its spread, but this was more on anecdotal information that Ron gathered from growers across the years. This is a picture of me in my much younger days down at the uh, river bottom. Well, and that's one of the things we did back in the, in the, in the, uh, the late 70s, early 80s, was evaluate uh, selection of material from different breeding programs from around the South as to the resistance or tolerance of Pierce disease. Many, many of them weren't, and Bradley's river bottom turned out to be a pretty hot spot. Pierce disease is named after M.B. Pierce, who first diagnosed the disease in, 19, in 1883. Uh, by, 19, by 1885, half the acreage near Anaheim, Anaheim California was dead. Uh, 1920s, the Central Valley had an epidemic. 35 to 48, the first statewide epidemic was reported in California. But the big game changer I'll talk about later is 1990s, late 1990s, when glycogen sharpshooter was introduced into California from Texas nurseries. Uh, biologically, it's a gram negative, rod shaped bacteria. It's xylem limited, it's the only place it occurs, we believe. Uh, it's native to the southeastern United States. Uh, opinions differ as to how long you've been here. Uh, conservative estimates run between 10,000 and 40,000 years. We believe it came up from, from Central America where it, it, it inhabited coffee. Um, it, it affects the grapevines by directly occluding the vascular system or the, or the xylem. It's obligatory vectored by insects. Uh, you know, there are anecdotal reports of it being moved, moved from plant to plant by pruning shears. Certainly we believe when root grafting occurs, it can move very slowly from plant to plant, but it's primarily an insect move disease. This bacterium is intolerant to cold temperatures. Now, this is an indirect effect, it's not a direct effect. If you take the grapevine cutting of a plant that's infected with Pierce disease and expose it to cold temperatures, nothing happens, it's still infected. And many of the, the old dogma was about a cutting infected with xylella could not root. That's not true. Even some of the susceptible varieties will root, but they'll immediately become symptomatic. But it's an indirect effect. We believe that cold shock proteins pr produce as a response to oxalic acid produced by roots over exposure to cold winter temperatures that actually go out and forage and kill this bacterium. Cold winters, long cold winters, can be therapeutic. We believe it's these cold temperatures that limits it to this bacteria's range to the north. <clears throat> it also affects vines by uh, enlarging the tyloses in plants, further including vascular tissue. Uh, then we really can't explain this scorching, this irregular leaf scorching. There's a biofilm called Castilian gum that's produced, again, further includes the xylem. But there's also strong speculation that there's some kind of toxin being produced that causes this, this irregular scorching and foliage. Symptoms are, are pretty, pretty straightforward. 
uh, it typically begins with a leaf scorch. Uh, and leaf scorch is quite variable depending by varieties. On red fruited varieties, you typically have a red halo uh, adjacent to the necrotic areas. On white varieties, you simply have a clearing or, or chlorotic uh, uh, segments of the, of the leaf appear prior to uh, necrosis. As, it, as the disease advances, you start to have the position of leaf blades, the petiole remain attached. Uh, you know, and these, these aren't really, uh, I would not call these hard and fast symptoms of PD. A lot of other things cause scorching. Downy mildew causes kind of defoliation. But when you start to see this irregular periderm formation, they call this green islanding, where the internodal area goes ahead and forms a periderm, but the nodes themselves remain green. And this is a very transitory uh, kind of symptom. That's pretty diagnostic of, of Pierce's disease. And finally, as, especially with the heat of summer and the heat of crop matur maturation, uh, gets higher toward maturity, they'll start to see cluster collapse and, and vine collapse. Now, one of the things that we believe, I mean, the more we work with this disease, really the, the more cloudy things have become. The old dogma was that there were very, very uh, hard and fast strain relationships. There, there are more than one strain in xylella. There's a, a strain that, that infects only citrus. We believe, theoretically, only citrus. Uh, there's, uh, an olive, there's an oleander strain that only infects al oleander. Peach bony strain is actually what we call the ragweed strain uh, that infects uh, oak leaves and peach bony. Now, the big question I've always had, we've got 1,400 acres of peaches in Gillespie County. We've got a PD epidemic. Why don't we have a peach bony epidemic? And there's nobody who can tell us that. Because in peach orchards, when you freeze out, you don't spray insecticides, so insects run rapid. Nobody can explain that to me, but there's something, something going on, and we believe actually humans are probably quite implicated in the movement of this pathogen from, from vineyard to vineyard. Okay, move a couple of years forward. This is Trisha Williams' vineyard. Uh, the uh, uh, growers were, were, were alarmed, vineyards are dying, and so they, they came to AM and they wanted some, some help. So, this is a picture of Trisha Williams, uh, uh, the young lady there on the far left, uh, with Neil Manoffin and Gerald Johnson crawling underneath the vines. And the first idea is we needed to understand what the supplemental source of this pathogen was. When you planted grapevines in a field, where was it that grape strain xylella? was coming from that would infect grapevines. So again, we, we kind of floundered. For 1998 to uh, 2001, we continued to apply for grants with the uh, California Department of Food and Agriculture. And they didn't, number one, they didn't know we had a grape industry here. And number two, they certainly didn't know we had Pierce's disease. So uh, we weren't funded. Finally, in 2002, we got our foot in the door with a USDA uh, APHIS cooperative agreement. 2002, we were funded at $150,000. Uh, 2003 went to $300,000, 450 in, in uh, 2004, and from then on it was $1.2 million a year. So we were well funded. The majority of the work, uh, the money went to the, in, to the entomologists for insect work. But our statewide priorities are number one, statewide mapping, vineyard mapping. Where is Pierce's disease? Where is it not? And what is its limiting its, its, uh, its range? Investigate the supplemental sources of the inoculum. Where is it coming from? Understand disease epidemiology within vineyards because the dogma was in California they swore there was no vine to vine movement. Where it's very clear in Texas, we strongly saw vine to vine movement. We needed to do statewide insect traffic to determine the vector diversity, abundance, range, and seasonality. When are the bad guys out there? When are they carrying the bacteria? And when did we need to be concerned? Uh, we have a colleague at the University of Houston downtown who's a first class uh, viticulturist. Uh, who uh, was working on uh, understanding the genetic diversity of the pathogen in its, in its native range. Uh, and then down to kind of what we ended up doing is evaluation of cyan and rootstock varieties for resistance or tolerance to the pathogen and uh, cooperating with the pathologist in the evaluation of biocontrol organisms. So again, 2002, this was our, our thinking point, what we knew and what we didn't know. Uh, Sandy Purcell, who has forgotten more about Pierce's disease than the rest of us will ever know, and Don from, from UC Berkeley, and Don Hopkins, a plant pathologist, who started working on Pierce's disease in 1968 in the University of Florida, published this map of the, the known and believed range of Pierce's disease in the United States. Pretty far, you see a lot of question marks in Texas, uh, you know, question marks in Arizona and New Mexico, uh, in the blue range here to the north. Uh, we didn't really know how far that actually, actually went. So, what is the range of, of Pierce disease in Texas and what limits its movement? Again, back to the old map of where we believed it to be. You can see it's strongly correlated with the chilling map. As we increase in the number of hours of chilling, 
we, we uh, decrease the probability of Pierce's disease. And it was to the point where places like Fort Davis at 5,000 feet and the high plains have received 1,200 hours of chilling, they thought there's no way. The dog who was Pierce's disease doesn't occur there. Well, we were wrong. Pierce's disease occurs in every great growing region of the state. Every place we're looking for, we're finding it. In 2005, we started seeing samples come back to the Texas Plant Disease Diagnostic Clinic, the confirmed PD at Alpine, confirmed, confirmed PD at Fort Davis, and we started finding hits along the Red River uh, and exceeding further north and, and further west than we ever thought before. Then in 2007, uh, a technician that was uh, research, an extension associate, a research associate that was working in the Texas High Plains came to us and said, you know, she asked me to show her Pierce disease in a vineyard. Went around, showed her Pierce disease in the vineyard. She goes, you know, I'm seeing this all over the High Plains. It's like, really? And she said, what should I do? I said, I think you ought to test it. So she went out and she tested. She sent in 14 samples, 13 from vineyards she believed to be uh, hot with Pierce disease, and one what she knew, what she thought to be clean. The 13 she thought to be hot all came back positive. The one that was negative came back negative. So we confirmed through PCR that xylella does indeed occur in the high plains. And in fact, it's in almost every vineyard we've tested. Uh, we had some work going on up there trying to understand. We believe that a lot of that, that disease is being brought in on contaminated nursery stock. Uh, funding fell apart for that, and quite frankly, the growers really weren't, weren't that interested in this pursuing working on Pierce disease in the high plains because they didn't want their bankers to know that they had PD there. But nonetheless, I mean, it's a very different disease in the high plains. In many cases, it's sublethal. You see symptoms here, symptoms there. You know, it tends to be more of a chronic disease than a than a than a, than a hard and fast uh, killer. But this past grape camp. Neil Newsom came up to Dave Apple and told him that every vine that he flagged in his vineyard that tested positive for Pierce disease was now dead. So it does kill, it certainly kills vines in, in, in uh, far west Texas, and now we have evidence that it kills them in the high plains. Also, PD is also confirmed in North Carolina, Virginia, Northwest Arkansas, Oklahoma, and Missouri. So this is what we now believe to be the expanded range of Pierce's disease. And the question remains, is Pat becoming more cold hardy? Well, possibly. Is the climate changing? Well, most probably. But as Don Hopkins says, the incidence of Pierce's disease is directly proportional to the number of people looking for it. So as we have more and more people looking at things and more and more people sampling, we're finding Pierce's disease in, in, in many of these areas. PD has, has, has been reported as far north as New Jersey. Xylella survives in oak trees, in maple trees, as far as, it, as Toronto, as far north as Toronto. So we know the pathogen has abilities past what we thought it could do. And during the course of our program, we've also worked either with applied research or educational programming, uh, programming with a lot of the other states, Oklahoma, Arkansas, Missouri, Florida, Alabama, and Virginia. So we, we've kind of developed a reputation of being the go-to people for Pierce disease these other options. And back to the disease, it's, it's like most diseases, you know, the, the old disease triangle. You have to have a source of the disease, which is most typically things like wildflowers, wild grapes, things like that. So the insect acquires a bacterium. The pathogen colonizes the forebed of the insect, and as it goes to grapevines to feed, it then inoculates grapevines. Now we've come to really understand that the pathologists have, I've learned a lot about from the pathologists over the course of the last 10 years, is that inoculation doesn't mean infection, infection doesn't necessarily mean disease. And if we take a vine like Norton, that tends to be pretty field resistant to Pierce disease, and place it in a low pressure situation, and it's fed on by a hot insect once a week, it does nothing really happens. If you take that Norton vine and you put it here in Austin County, Texas, where it's fed on by a hot insect 30 times a day, it's a very different situation. The, the plant is challenged by a far higher tidal load of the bacterium and it's being inoculated to many more points. It simply can't overcome it. So it's it, it's a plant defense. Plant defenses certainly are involved here, uh, but but it's so when we say you know, inoculation and infection and disease, they don't always mean the same thing. So just where is Zylella anyway? You know, it depends on where you look. You go to the Gulf Coast, it's, it's in damn near every plant you find. You can go sample everything, you sample 100 plants, 80 of them will help Zylella. Now one of the hard things we've, we've had to struggle with is when we PCR these to the path bar, to which type, is it ragweed strain, is it grape strain, what is it? It almost always comes back ragweed strain. And we think that that's a dilution plate problem because we think that in many cases, both strains of the pathogen inhabit the same plant. 
And as we dilute, dilute plate it out to get away, because it's, it's steady okay, it's a very slow growing organism. So when we finally get xylo population growing, it's commonly overrun by, by ragweed strain. So in, in the matter of fact is, when we go to where we find grape strain in Texas, the only place we pull grape strain out is out of wild grape vines. And we know that can't be the case, because we'll plant vineyards far away from wild grape vines, and we'll get hammered with peas. So it's out there somewhere. You know, and in many cases, when we look at the insect, the insect has several strains in their mouth part. So there's some speculation, you know, there's some genetic exchange of information going on. We really don't know. Never got too far down that, that road. It, it, that was an academic question, but in terms of, of solving the problem, it didn't really have that much to do with it. Dave Apple did some incredible work over the course of, of uh, five years in the Hill Country. This is a, a map, and, and this is Vector Vineyard, which is one of their VNA blocks. July 2003, through the progression through July 2005, it's clearly a polycyclic disease. It is, there's clearly vine to vine spread. And the vine to vine spread is much stronger up and down the road than across roads. So this kind of led us to Dave Apple's roading uh, recommendation. We'll talk about it a little bit later. But you know, we have clear evidence here that the disease is behaving very differently uh, in Texas than it was reported to in California. OK, here the game was a game changer. Uh, when we first started this program, California, or when 20 years ago, California had three vectors of, of Pierce disease. Blue-green sharpshooter, green sharpshooter, and red-headed sharpshooter. All very short flyers, all had very, you had a very strong edge effect. You'd see PD in first four or five rows in from a wooded edge. You wouldn't see center strikes anywhere. And then this guy flew in. It's a different subfamily of, of, of uh, Cicadella, uh, and it, it has much, uh, much different uh, activities. It's a distant flyer. These guys can fly for a mile at a time. They feed on woody tissue. What that means is when you have the, the vectors to California's head and they fed on, on green shoot tips, many times that infected wood would be pruned off during dormant pruning. When you have these guys feeding on spurs and trunks, that doesn't get pruned off during dormant pruning. So an infection would much more likely be persistent when this when spread by this insect. So when feed on woody tissue, we had strong vine to vine spreading. You can see these guys behaving in and then they look like squirrels. They run up and down the shoots and collect squirrels. It's, it's amazing. <coughs> so all sharpshooters are voracious feeders, and they need to change their feeding posts very frequently. This is something we can use to kind of outsmart this these, this 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 uh, guild of vectors and, and overcome the disease. When we started doing the insect surveys, I actually before the entomologists got involved, I was the one doing the insect surveys, and we were out at the pork farm today. And George Ray let me put insect traps up in up in the vineyards here, and we. We collected a diversity of insects from across the state. You know, where California went from three to four vectors, we have 36 species of competent vectors that are identified, and that doesn't include those we found on the high plains. There are another half a dozen up there that don't occur anywhere else. Um, and then, uh, you know, their, their abundance and which species uh, depends on what part of the state you're in. Uh, different parts of the state will have uh, a higher concentrations of one versus the other. Uh, but the, the, the two subfamilies that we're really breaking them down to of importance are the Proconidae. This is Quernicostalis. It's, it's a one that we I commonly see this more feeding on our pears and our grapevines. On Chromatopia orbona, which is a, a tropical looking thing that exists in the eastern part of the state. This is Glassoline sharpshooter. And Paralyses errorata. This is actually one of the species that's more important in vectoring the disease in the Carolinas and Virginia than it is here, but we do find it here. So these are all the distant flyers, all the ones that can feed on woody tissue. These are the ones that are probably the most problematic in most of the state. Except when you go to the eastern part of the state, the cicadellids. These are the short flyers, like the red-headed sharpshooter and the blue-green sharpshooter that they have in California. So they, they're bothersome simply in their sheer volume of numbers. When we were doing some insect surveys in, over in East Texas, and somebody would cut a hay field, there would be so many sharpshooters, you couldn't count them all. There wasn't room for another sharpshooter to hit the car. So their, 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 their numbers can be overwhelming. Very different subfamilies have very different fly patterns and cicadellids uh, or short flyers, and we see the strong edge effect with them. But on the other hand, Corcani uh, are much more distant flyers. Now, in terms of vectoring efficiency, the cicadellids are much more efficient. And there's a long story behind it, but and they, they infect grapevines about 90% of the time. 90% of their feeding episodes will result in infection of a grapevine under greenhouse situations. Only about half the feeding episodes of Procani. So they're much more distant flyers, different fly patterns, but these are much more uh, efficient at vectoring the pathogen than, than things like glass of sharpshooter. 
So when we think back, and, and I really have to thank Andrew Lobby, uh stepped up to the plate and did a lot of uh, the, the uh, uh, statistics on the insects. Uh, I don't really want to get into the politics, but the, uh, the intermodels kind of uh, uh, opted out of the program before we had a chance to really analyze the data. And Andrew's brother's a fish biologist, and it turns out they've run similar analyses on fish than they've done on insects. So Andrew and his brother stepped up to the plate and helped us understand exactly what was going on a statewide basis and what's going on a regional basis. So when we take a look at the statewide basis, there's three subfamilies that are primarily at play. And again, the Proconidae are 60, 60, a little over 60% of the, of the major uh, vectors. The, the uh, Cicadellas are about 26%. And these class doctors, these are spittle bugs. We believe this is what spread the disease in Fort Davis. They're the ones you see, you know, pestering your pecan trees in the late spring. Uh, they're quite cap capable of spreading Salella as well. And again, what we're seeing is that you're seeing the number of vectors decrease over time. Now, part of this is in effect to drought, part of this is in effect to cold winter temperatures, but you clearly see a decline in insect populations across all parts of the state over time to get, well, guess what? Record drought, 2011, we have in Sharpshire, all the parts were coming back empty. So, Pierce's disease has always been a cyclic disease. I think we're starting to understand why. It's the weather patterns more than anything that are playing with vector populations uh, that are responsible for this for this cyclic effect. Um, the regional comparisons. This is the real country where we were, and what we're also believing is happening is that the animals did come up with this: is that where growers are using a midclover, which is a systemic nicotinoid insecticide, we're clearly seeing insect populations decline. Now, is that greater than the effect of weather? Is that additive to the effect of weather? We don't really know, but we do know this. So this is the hill country where growers are using, using imidacloprid. This is the Gulf Coast where growers are only growing collard varieties and are not using imidacloprid. Again, clearly you're seeing a fall off on insect numbers where insecticides have nothing to do with them. So we believe this to be strictly a weather effect. Before we, we go really uh, much more into that, that's kind of the insect part of it. We need to make, clarify terms here in terms of a plant's response to Zalella fastidios, at least plants that are theoretically susceptible. You have plants that are susceptible, such as all the cultivars of Vitus vinifera. Within those, you'll have great differences in field longevity. Vines like Chardonnay commonly become symptomatic, may even die the same year they're infected. And others, such as Cabernet Sauvignon, may become infected and not be even symptomatic for several years until they finally start to show symptoms. And, and then ultimately will die. So there's a lot of range of, of, of susceptibility. There's resistance. And, and the grapes that we're growing here in Texas right now, and even our, our wild species, we don't think they're resistant. We think they're tolerant. Resistance is the ability of the host to limit colonization of the pathogen. And Andy Walker, the great reader of UC Davis, is really focused on this because he believes the long-term success of this strategy is to keep the titer of the bacteria low in the grapevines. So he's using Vitus small eye, but primarily Vitus Arizona. Because his big, his big uh, home run that he did is he found out that all of the genes for tolerance to Pierce's disease or resistance to Pierce's disease in this species are all on a single locus. So he can use marker assisted breeding, and he can rapidly go through that and go, he, he, we, we went through 75% Vitus vinifera, 87.5% vinifera, which is what we're testing now. We now have four lines of his 94% vinifera, and he's also going to 97% vinifera. Basically, at 94%, you can't tell there's any hydrogen in it at all, and he feels there's no problem going past 97. He's now going back and trying to incorporate other sources of resistance to make sure that resistance is a little more durable over time. Uh, but this is this is the home run, and this is the really our big hope. Uh, vines coming out of this breeding program right here, we think they had the greatest uh, hope of, of being tolerant or resistant and having very high uh, high quality. Tolerant things like black Spanish, Blanc de Bois. Uh, are, are tolerant, which means they can withstand high tides of the bacterium, but the tides plateau in the summer, and then they fall in the winter, and so the vine can become state productive and, uh, and, and, and grow well even in the presence of the bacteria. Now, under high crop stress, under high heat stress, it'll be symptomatic. It'll have scorched leaves. Doesn't seem to bother it. The one thing that we have uh, made a strong recommendation with the growers is to avoid planting tolerant varieties in close proximity to susceptible blocks. And time and time again, you always say, well, I'm going to hedge my bet. I'm going to find Chardonnay over here. I'm going to plant Blanc de Bois over here. Mistake. You've got a vine that's clearly propagated and full of xylella right next to one that's susceptible. All that's one feeding episode away from, from transmission to the next block. So we suggest you keep those blocks apart. 
This was an interesting situation. And George Ray knows this, this location better than anybody. This is Fall Creek Vineyards. Fall Creek Vineyards in Tau, Texas. There are poster children for Pearson's disease. They, how many times have they been wiped out, George? Three, four, five times? Three times. Oh. Totally wiped out. The last planting they had of Chardonnay, 90% of the vines became symptomatic the first year after they were planted. It was just, it was, it's, it's, it's a great laboratory setting. I mean, you talk about high Pearson's disease pressure, it's there. And there at Fall Creek, there's this grapevine growing. So I went up to Tom Barkley, who's the, uh, the vineyard manager and the winery manager. Tom Barkley was also my TA in plant propagation here in 1975. So, and I said, Tom, what is this vine? He said, that's oh, just an old rootstock stuff. The top broke off of it, we just planted it out by the shed. So this is SO4. Man, everything else in the vineyard's dead. And, and here's this SO4 vine. There's some scorch on it, but it's just doing great. So it's like, hmm, start thinking back. What's the package behind SO4? Well, it's half bodies of the area. It's the native species of the hill country. So, so you know, many of our native roots, many of our rootstocks we use are derived from native Texas species. So uh, Mark Black was my partner in this, and we planted a, uh, an unwrapped rootstock study in Tau, Texas, to try and understand tolerance uh, to this pathogen. Again, native Texas species, Mustangiensis, Berlandieri, Monticola, Repester, Champagne, so on and so forth. The, the genetics in, in Texas, grapevine genetics in Texas is, is quite confusing, uh, but there are some clear species and, and many of these are incorporated in some of the rootstocks. So you see uh, on, on the right hand side, this is from Bruce Reich's book on, on grape breeding, his, his map of, of uh, uh, distribution of the different species, Repesters and Berlandieri on the top and bottom. And the rootstocks we use, 5C, which is Berlandi area by Riparia, 1103 Paul, Paulson, Berlandi area by Repestris, 110R, same cross, Berlandi area by Repestris, Champanel, Berlandi area by Candy Can, Champagne, we don't know really what Champanel is, Salt Creek, which is believed to be Champagne, oops, uh, Champagne, I mean, you know, what is Champagne? It's probably a Mustang, Berlandi area, Repestris cross, we don't know what things are. Uh, uh, Dog Ridge, Natural high, Hybrid, and Candy Can Farm with Pesterous. Harmony and Freedom with the two stocks they use up on the High Plains. It's 1613 by Champagne, 1616C, uh, 1613C, and two more land area crosses, 5BB and SO4. So those are the dozen plants that we put in the ground, unwrapped it simply to see what their response was under enormous uh, piece of Pierce disease pressure. So what we uh, we rated them for is, is basically a vine response. The parameters were PD symptom rating, is the visual rating, annual growing and pruning weights, or how much did the vine weigh, and it's, that's what I learned from the guy this morning. Now that's the way you measure, measure vine response is by growing and pruning weights. It tells you how vigorous these things are. And then by ELISA testing, and then doing optical density of, of the ELISA wells. Vines were planted in 2005, measurements were taken in 5, 6, and 7. Final printing weights taken in the spring of 2007 when we pulled the block. And here's what we saw over 2006, 2007. 2006, clearly, these were young vines, uh, you know, up to two pound vines, uh, and, and there was some variability in it, but it was really after exposure to strong disease pressure. In 2007, we saw a huge difference in response in terms of annual pruning weight. Statistically, What's that? Uh, your place, fresh, 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 uh, so we do have quite a bit of statistical difference. You know, when we get to the point where we have gorillas like Richter 110, Salt Creek, and Dog Ridge, that I mean, yeah, these are great, they're surviving, they're growing well. This is not a commercially acceptable stock. We don't want 12 pond vines out there. And it's, it's viticulturally unacceptable. We'll, we'll get back to that. There's a place for those. So when we take a look at, at rating, uh, PD symptoms uh, on, the, on the Y axis and the ELISA scores are up with density on the X axis. You can see that these things break out pretty clearly to the point where we think that we can really identify highly susceptible varieties such as 16, 16, 16, 13, and 5 dB, the moderately susceptible varieties such as SO4, 1103 Paulson, and 5 c and Richter 110, versus clearly tolerant varieties that are not showing as much ELISA light up and that aren't showing as many visual symptoms, Salt Creek, Dog Ridge, and Champanel. 
One thing to notice is that freedom and harmony are not included in this because they're already dead. They have just flat out died. So, so what is OD up there? Optical density. It's, it's basically how, how, how much color is in that Eliza well. If you, if you, and that's running at 630 nanometers. They run an optical density on the plate. The Eliza plate. When you, oh, when you light the Eliza plate up, how, how bright is oh. that Eliza plate? So it basically, how strong is, is the anti-zero reaction in, in the Eliza plate? You the bottom on the left, what are those salt free coverage? Champanel. Now, Champanel is, is, is nice in that we're only looking at about a four pound bind, whereas salt free and dog are part of, the, part of the real gorillas. But, but still, I mean, even the, the but again, these, these vines here, they're, they're scorched, they're lighting up the Eliza wells, but they're keeping, I mean, they're, they're not, they're, they're maintaining their pruning roots. So if they're living quite well in the presence of this bacteria, they're just showing, they're harboring a high pattern of bacteria and just showing a lot of symptoms. So that's not, just, we really don't want that, but it, it tells us that there's at least some ability to tolerate the pathogen. The key to that is, back up, the, they're 50-50 on their pest and Yes. Two riparian, two Okay. Yes. Okay. So that apparently is, yeah, yeah. So one's not better than the other. Apparently the not. Same. Apparently not. Yeah. Okay. Good. So, so with that knowledge, we kind of, you know, uh, that was kind of the preliminary uh, uh, study we did that basically gave rise for uh, us to, to go into some expanded rootstock studies. I'm going to talk about in, in, a, in a second. But uh, you know, through the course of doing this applied research, a lot of the work we did was working with growers to develop a management program. We spent a lot of time doing the outreach program. We had a PD notes and newsletter, website, annual PD uh, state research symposium, and then grower education through Wine Grape Growers Association, our local extension events, uh, uh, and direct grower education. So we spent a lot of time working with growers. And I mean, it's, you know, all of us in extension growers in the position of trying to work ourselves out of a job, and, and we kind of did in this case. It really wasn't all our benefit. The weather helped a lot. Uh, but. Uh, We've been pretty successful in putting together a management plan for, for PD. And, and there's really about six steps that we think uh, we need to, uh, you know, we continue to emphasize with the growers. And then number one is acknowledge risk. You know, there are people that continue to plant uh, vinifera in very high risk sites, and that's still a bad decision. Uh, choose sites with PD management in mind. You want to choose sites with limited or no perennial vegetation. You don't want sites that harbor sharp shooters over the course of the dry summer. Avoid sites with perennial vegetation and access to water during the summer. It's, it's not the water per se, it's the plants that have access to the water that draw the sharpshooters. And use appropriate rootstocks and varieties for the location. Two, create a buffer area, remove suspected supplemental hosts. Uh, basically, clearly, uh, the, the vegetation management, especially the removal of wild grapevines, uh, is, is key in, in limiting uh, the introduction of this, this pathogen into the vineyard. This is probably the biggest tool we have in our toolbox right now. There's an uh, imidacloprid is one of a series of neonicotinoid insecticides uh, that is a feeding deterrent. If, if sharpshooters feed, they immediately become disoriented and stop feeding and they die. Uh, this has clearly been, you know, the biggest management tool we have. Uh, we inject it once about the middle of April, and next time about the 1st of May, split applications, and it gives us at least 15 parts per billion imidacloprid in the vine for about 13 months. So on an annual basis, we're keeping that, that imidacloprid content up to the point where it, it continues to be affected. Um, this is the product. I don't want to get too much into products, but it's a, it was a buyer product. There's not a lot of generics on the market. So basically, you can treat acres for about $36 an acre. That's not very much when you talk about the healthier vines. 30-day uh, pre-harvest interval on it. It's, you know, it, it's soft on beneficials or kills kills mealy bugs, it, you know, the long term, it kills lots for us. So there's a lot of side benefits. So the guys even up in the high plains who claim they don't have Pierce disease, some of them are using medical for simply to manage leaf hoppers. So it's win-win. Does the medical for work? This is a, a, a trip I took out to California to, to speak to the California Pierce Disease Board. And we went to Temecula and we saw a vineyard. And uh, this is basically an entire block that was wiped out by glassoline sharpshooter in 2000. It was since, since replanted. The vineyard in the front did not use a mini cloper. The, the boundary line is the red line. The vineyard behind it did use a mini cloper. Yeah, it works. Keys to effective management learn and identify vectors. It's important for growers to, to, to learn to identify which vectors are out there 
moving the disease, and monitor vector of abundance and seasonality. At this point, we are not using foliar sprays uh, to manage sharpshooters. The imidacloprid is doing a fine job. But there was a time back in 2003, 2004, that over the course of Memorial Day, the sky would literally rain sharpshooters. There would be thousands of sharpshooters entering vineyards. And at that point, a knockdown spray may be important. So it's simply a, a, good, a good idea for growers to keep their eyes open and know what's going on in the vineyard. So, uh, implement superior floor management practices and manage uh, vegetation adjacent to vineyards. You know, most sharpshooters don't like to feed on grapevines. They like other things. They, 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 because vinyl fluid is, is, is almost all water, they have to change feeding holes very frequently. So if you have an area that is you know, devoid of, of alternative feeding sources for them, they don't want to go there. So close vegetation management in, in combination with the metacloprid are the number one, two very, very effective tools in keeping sharpshooters out of the vineyard. Number six, uh, become familiar with the symptoms. Laboratory test to confirm visual symptoms. We don't suggest a grower test every single vine they suspect to be infected. It is important for them to train their eye to learn to identify pierce disease in their vineyard. And when you see it, pull it out. Uh, you know, and, and people ask, well, wouldn't you rather, I'd rather have something like uh, Cabernet Sauvignon that becomes infected and lives for several years after it's infected. Well, not me. I'd rather know it's there. If the cab is infected, and it's there as a source of an inoculum for vine to vine spread, and you don't pull it out, you've got a problem. If you've got Chardonnay, if you've got Sangiovese, VNDA, something that's very sensitive, and you see it when it gets infected, you can pull it out right then. So, roguing is an extremely important part of, of managing the epidemic of, an, of a polycyclic disease inside of a vineyard. Uh, another one that, uh, another item that some growers are implementing is the use of trap crops. You know, we, we don't really use a metacloprid with these trap crops because the metacloprid is a feeding deterrent. In trap crops, you want the insects to feed. So there's another neonicotinoid, there's actually a couple of them. Thoxan is really quite expensive. Most growers are going to dun and pep your in. The product in grape is called Venom Safari, is an ornamental label. So this is a picture of Williamsburg Vineyard in, in Virginia with a big line of crepe myrtles. The only thing like the sharpshooters like more than mountain laurel is crepe myrtles. And uh, so this is a very effective tool if you, if you, if you put down the tetran along this crepe myrtle hedge, you're basically knocking the sharpshooters down before they have a chance to come into the vineyard. This is all, that's also a preferential over position hose. They love to reproduce on crepe myrtle. So it's a course of the last 10 years of work. Um, a, a number of my colleagues and I, Andrew, me, uh, Jason Lewis, uh, Dave Apple, uh, Mark Black, have put out a, a, a PD pest management guide. It's uh, about 103 pages. It's actually gotten more attention out of the state than it's gotten in the state. Uh, Mark put it up on Aggie Horticulture. It's free to download. And so uh, we think it's, it's, it's a very effective guide. It's, it's basically way more than anybody would ever want to know about Pierce disease and how to manage it. Uh, but we, bet, we feel we're better off uh, erring on the side of, of uh, too much information than not enough. Okay, putting it all together, what did we learn from our work? From our work? Right now, you know, unfortunately, growers are, are um, complacent. We got we got PD lit. So what's next? We need to work on this. We need to work on that. Well, I'm sorry, you know, right now PD appears manageable, but that hasn't been all our effort. Number one, PD's always been a polycyclic disease. The coal events in 2010 and 2011 were probably quite curative to the grapevines. They were also, they hammered the heck out of sharpshooter populations. The drought of 2010, 2011, the worst unrecorded history in the hill country was devastating to sharpshooter populations. And number one, and the last one, the most important, we're in danger of using a midi-clover because of beehive colony collapse. And grapevines are wind pollinated crops. So grapevines don't really visit them. But if you put a midi clover down in your vineyard and you have bird clover in your vineyard, bees are sure gonna visit the bee clover or the, 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 the bird clover and take it back to the hive. It's, it's, again, it's, it's a chronic problem with bees. It acutely doesn't kill them, but it makes them susceptible to another, a number of other, other pathogens. There's a big movement to uh, completely ban or certainly limit the use of a clover. But we're still in terms of a long-term solution. I mean, this is the point. We always thought it was the job of the entomologist to buy the rest of his time, to buy the horticulturist and the plant pathologist's time to come up with a long-term solution. So here we are, post plants resistance, which is kind of the path we've chosen to follow. Now, you know, the, 
we're working with conventional breeding. I also work on, um, on the California Department of Food and Agriculture's advisory committee to evaluate there are five different scientists that have transgenic lines in California. And really, they are really, really good scientists, but they're really, really not good viticulturists. So we, they really needed some help in learning how to grow vines and evaluate vines. And it's, 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 it's been a good experience. Uh, but I'll tell you right now, Andy Walker is head and shoulders ahead of them. I mean, he's got stuff that is, is ready to release. Um, and so and Andy Walker's is not the only uh, material we're testing, but again, he has 87 and a half, 94, which we have, and then 97% Vinifera with, with full resistance and extremely high quality. Our job, we feel, to, to test them here in Texas is number one, will they perform under our climatic conditions? Number two, will it sustain the, the barrage of fungal pathogens we have that California doesn't? And number three, will they ripen to high quality in our climate? So we have spent over the last few years uh, a, a lot of time and effort and put a lot of miles on the truck to, to establish two variety trials. They're 300 miles apart. The first one's over here in Industry, Texas, in Austin County, about 15, 17 miles uh, south of Brenham uh, at Doug Rowlett's Vineyard. It's a commercial Blanc de Bois Vineyard. Doug got hammered down in the Mill Creek uh, Monday night. His Blanc down there froze. I already set our variety product, which looks pretty good. He had 30 degrees three nights in a row. But these vines are in our first crop this last year. Uh, the second uh, plot we have is in Real County uh, near Lakey. Uh, a grower has basically spent about $750,000 to build this infrastructure. He's high fenced 20 acres, drilled the well, put in, put in trellis, put in irrigation system, dug the holes. So all we had to do is go pop the vines in the ground. I mean, it, 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 it really isn't, uh, it, it's still a lot of work, but uh, uh, training the vines, maintaining the vines, and these vines will be in production this year. So we'll be looking at all these sets of, uh, all these sets of selections. Uh, in, in hopefully in production uh, this, this coming year. Two evaluation sites that are modeled apart, very different climates and soils. Uh, Austin County, we've got sandy soils. Uh, you know, it's, it's a warm climate, it rains a lot. Uh, Lakey, it is the, the most chalky soil you can imagine. It's a beautiful hill country site. The, the dilemma in the hill country is where we have soil, we have no air drainage. Where we have air drainage, we have no soil. This site is both. It's, it's degenerative uh, uh, caliche, but it's got tons and tons of air drainage. We think we escape frost on this Sunday, Monday night. I'll go see tomorrow. But in addition to uh, Andy's material, we're uh, testing Munson heirloom varieties. Now, when, uh, when we first started this, I called Justin Morris. I said, Justin, has anybody ever done formal evaluations on Munson stuff? He goes, well, we did, but we never published anything. So, so uh, we thought we had to go through the literature and find uh, eight of Munson's best varieties that reportedly had the most vinifera and the, most, the best wine quality and, and put, them into our, put them into our test. There's actually a couple of Jim Moore selections, Arkansas 1475 and 1400, that appear to be PD tolerant as a result of having uh, uh, tolerant uh, germplasm in their background. They weren't bred for PD tolerance, but they appear to be. There's also two German varieties that are bred for powdery mildew resistance, or perhaps three, but certainly Phoenix and Orion, that appear to be PD tolerant, that are in, in our uh, tests. Uh, and then Jan Lu at Florida a and has some, some wild stuff. A couple of them look, look pretty good, uh, but there's some selections from Florida a and and then the UC Davis. And then we have some others, anecdotal things, uh, uh, private breeders, and so on and so forth. We actually, uh, we called uh, about 30% out of industry this last year. We evaluated them. There's no point in, in, in uh, riding a losing horse in more races than you have to. And we've got new material to go in their slot, so you know you can't you can't sit and look at this stuff forever. You got to move on and, and keep what's good and pull out what's bad. The data collection. Uh, we're working with Lisa Miranda to quantify PD tolerance and all of these things. Uh, we're quantifying vigor, taking pruning weights, phenology, bud rate, flowering, and duration, and then the whole components you yield. You know, how many buds, how many shoots, how many clusters, how many berries, berry weight, blah, blah, blah. Through chemistry, and then wine quality. Andrew and, and, and Adam have, have taken it to the next level. We've got a wine, a small wine lab set up in Fredericksburg where they're taking it to, uh, to uh, organoelectric evaluation of, of wine. We're bringing in uh, educated winemakers from the hill country who actually can taste through. I mean, we're not trying to make the best blend we can out of these, these grapes. We're trying to make cookie cutter samples so we can evaluate what's the grape potential. And that's 
It's a guy named Gary Main that worked for, for Justin who did exactly the same thing. And that's the way you put you, you evaluate variety next, next to variety. We give them to these winemakers, uh, and uh, they were, we, that's why you, they, they had very different results than what we would come up with. But since we're too close to it, it it's really better to have outside input. This is the look at the plot. Uh, you know, in variety trials, and I've been criticized by some that who didn't work in variety trials a lot, that well, you don't have replicated plots there. Well, in variety trials, site locations are your replications. So when we, we do nine line plots, so we can take, they'll be able to make a call more line out of them. But when it comes to testing for xylella resistance or, 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 or presence, my colleague Lisa Brown made the argument, yes, you need a, a, a replicated plot. So we have five different varieties that are finding in a replicated plot, so we can do statistical analysis on the titer bacteria within, within those uh, accessions. In, in the non-replicated plot, that's what we're seeing. We're seeing uh, things like Arkansas, or excuse me, this uh, 044, which is one of Jane Lou's, is, is, has an incredible titer. Uh, Mortensen Hardy, which is uh, one of John Mortensen's uh, mutations, we believe. Uh, I'll, I'll, you can see just, there's, there's some variability among them, but it's clear we at least have xylella in our plots, which is what we want. When we take a look at the replicated plots, we can see there's some differences. And unfortunately, I don't think this is going to be good news to Andy Walker because his whole point was that he expected his, his selections to, to tolerate, to, to have no more than 10 to the third bacteria. And we're probably looking at more like 10 to the sixth. So there's a lot more bacteria in there than Andy was planning on being able to tolerate. We're trying to figure out who's going to break the news to There are some ones that have, uh, appear to be quite good. Uh, this one's called 20. We simply refer to it as 20, uh, UO5 to 20. Uh, and and he said even out of the 91 to 97% vinifer, this one still shines. He thinks that this is one that they're going to release. And he makes a very nice wine out of it. And winemakers have rated it very highly. Unfortunately, it's very, very susceptible to downy mildew. So it's not, you're not going to be able to spray it on a, on a, on a blunt de bois program and get away with it. Uh, it's 82466 Jane Lou's. It's, it's another wild one with pretty high yield, some good fruit quality. And uh, another one of Andy Walker's are red. So again, taking it to the wine menu. 2011, we had a joint release with the University of Arkansas and the Tarkingtons from down in Victoria. This Victoria Red is a beautiful PD tolerant, a seeded table grape. There's a seedless one that's in the works that has viruses. We're getting foundation plant material to clean it up. Expanded rootstock evaluations in Austin uh, as well. Uh, we, we took, we, we felt, we saw there's an impact of this, but the point of this new rootstock trial is, you know, this was basically our foot in the door. We saw that there was an impact of rootstock on PD tolerance, but forever we've needed on rootstock data on rootstock performance in Texas vineyards for viticultural reasons. So we have three locations, one at Lakey, one at Becker Vineyards in Gillespie County, and the third one uh, at, at, uh, at Industry, Texas. We're evaluating influence on vine vigor and yield, data blood weight, cold hardiness, nutrient uptake, tolerant to pierce disease, and cotton root rot. We, we're seeing a lot of nutrient deficiency in these, and this is one thing that we're scoring them for, and it's a follow-up we're going through with, with pale analyses be able to collect data on which vines are more efficient at taking up different nutrients. Nitrogen is pretty simple, but we've run into a problem. We run into a problem because it appears the soil water and forest testing lab, they may have a diagnostic problem. Uh, the nitrogen and magnesium levels all look very clear. Uh, there's, there's, uh, there's clearly a difference between stops, there's clearly a difference between locations. But when you get to elements like phosphorus, these, these are, all of these vines, if this is true, at 0.8 percent phosphorus, all of these vines should have phosphorus deficiency. None of them have phosphorus deficiency. So we think that there's a problem with the lab. Also, when we go to iron, well, there, this 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 appears to be we're seeing some iron deficiency in some, but but this we have, this also appears to be somewhat problematic. But most of all, sodium. You know, when I see a vine that's got 1,200, 1,300 parts per million sodium in it, I'm seeing scorching. The A&M lab is telling us we've got stuff at 3,000, 4,000, almost 5,000 parts per million sodium. We're not seeing any scorching. Something's not right in this world. So we decided to do a test. I talked to Tony Crow because we, when I did paleo, when we did the story products to do leaf washing, we all washed them in dregs. Phosphorus free detergent, not that any phosphorus contamination. Tony goes, well, you contaminated them with sodium. That's why the sodium level is so high. You should have washed them with hydrochloric acid. 
So we did pay. God went back out to the plots. We cut, we collected payoffs, we cut the payoffs in half, so there's not a difference in payoffs. And we did direct detergent versus hydrochloric acid wash versus water wash. There's no differences between those techniques and washing. Uh, there are also, in, in the other plots, there's no differences between plots. But when we sent another sample to a &L labs, numbers came back very, very different. And specifically, the elements we're problematic with is magnesium. You know, look at these magnesium numbers. We did 630 A&L lab. Iron, 15, 13, 11, 164. So, and then sodium. This is about where I expect them to be. But we're looking at 35, 3,600 parts per million sodium. There's no way. So, Tony Cole has been very good, and actually Larry Stein got Mark McFarland to intercede with this, and we're working with them to try and rectify this. But number one, spend a thousand dollars on petio samples, and number two, I can't leave the day. So we're trying to work on solving that. Printing weights, Andrew just worked this up. These are preliminary printing weights. We're seeing, I mean, these are these are secondary fines. We're seeing some differences. Mainly, we're seeing differences between sites and, and how uh, how vigorous they are. Uh, a couple of other things we're involved in. Uh, Don Hopkins from Florida has a, a, a benign strain of xylella uh, that appears to peck, uh, protect grapevines from virulent strains of PD. Uh, Dave Apple is the lead in this project. He has greenhouse experiments. We have our, our plot in Fredericksburg, and it's tested in different parts of the United States as well. It appears to be holding up. Uh, it appeared that, that especially young vines, when they're inoculated with EV92-1, are protected for the life of that vine from PD. Other things we're doing in our spare time uh, is uh, we're evaluating, we have uh, four different crops that we are evaluating that have no fungicide, no insecticide sprays, figs, pomegranates, pears, and blackberries. It's basically an acre of ground that was a, a buffer between our vineyard and what used to be an insect growing facility that Mark Hussey said, go do something other than grow Johnson grass on it. So we did. So that's, that's, that's kind of what, what we do with our time. We're working with Dave Apple and Sheila McBride. She was doing her master's work on uh, cotton root rot from Plasticopsis. There appears to be an active chemistry through trifall. Uh, we've got trials at, in Travis County and in Real County. And in addition, that's kind of one of the side benefits of our rootstock trial. In addition to looking at its ability impact on vines and pea, we're also looking at tolerance or survival of cotton root rot. Last, I'm done, but you know, we're in transition in Fredericksburg. We were a PD lab, we were funded by US, uh, USDA APHIS. Uh, our building uh, was basically on the, on the chopping blocks on the market. The guy that sponsors our research at, at Lakey bought it and is in the process of giving it to AM. Uh, the growers are mustering their efforts to try and help us pay the bills, the utilities. Uh, and we, you know, it's, it's my job to keep uh, grant money coming in to keep these guys employed. Uh, you know, you, all of you know how much tougher that is in these times. Uh, we put in for an after grant, we just put in for uh, a TDA grant, which we're running on right now. And uh, the next one Andrew wants to put in for is Southern Region IPM. So we're, uh, we're struggling at every, every ball that comes across the plate, but uh, that's what we do. Any questions?